Live from the Washington, D.C. area, it's the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. All the ecology news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's your host, Executive Director of the Emerald Planet, Dr. Sam Lee Hancock. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you from Washington, D.C. in the United States as we look around the globe in 144 different nations looking for those thousand best practices, the technologies, the services, and the products that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And of course, we're looking for the people that are providing the leadership as we go to a planet with 9 billion people by 2050 and possibly 12 to 13 billion by the end of the century. And how we're going to be able to take care of all these people so that we're increasing the quality of life is one of the questions that needs to be resolved. I have a gentleman sit right beside me who thinks he has an answer to some, if not all, of these uh, questions that we're just talking about. This is Christopher King, and he goes by King, so I'll keep calling you King. Uh, <laughs> Co-founder and president of what's called Conscious Capitalism. He's the uh, president of the D.C. chapter and also the business director for Conscious Business Nexus. So I'm looking forward to us to uh, learn about all these things, King. But welcome to the Emerald Planet TV. Thank you, Dr. Sam. Thank you for having me. I'm glad you're here. And, and thank you for telling me about this uh, conscious capitalism. It's a very intriguing notion. And it's different than uh, most people think about as far as what business, enterprise, entrepreneurship is all about. So tell us a little bit about this conscious capitalism and then also a little more about this conscious business nexus and then we'll really get into the meat of our discussion. Absolutely. Well, you know, conscious capitalism is um, from a lot of folks who call it oxymoron. A lot of folks look at capitalism as being an evil beast. And what we like to say in conscious capitalism is that we practice capitalism with a conscious. And what we do is we have four operating core principles that we adhere by as business professionals. Number one is that we believe in doing business with a higher purpose. And when I say a higher purpose, meaning a purpose greater than just making a profit. Like, for example, computers need electricity to operate. But that's not the primary purpose of a computer is to generate electricity. It's, a, it's an actual same thing with business. A business needs money to operate, but that's not the primary purpose mm -hmm. of a conscious business. And so one thing I'd like to share with you on a higher purpose is a quick little story to illustrate our point with that. Okay. Um, there's a quote by um, the yogi practitioner um, Patanjali. He talks about that when you have a higher purpose, all your thoughts break their bonds. Your mind transcends limitations. Your consciousness expands in all directions. Endless, boundless, and thoughts come alive. And everyone, and you find yourself to be in a place that everyone that you connect with feels your energy and love. Yeah, the whole thing about this, and this is what I really like about this whole notion, is that you're going beyond yourself and you're working in a very collaborative environment. Yes. And it's, it's virtual, it's amorphous, but at the same time, you're all connected by thoughts, energy, spirit. Yes. And I think this is where you're going. What's the next uh, three aspects of this? The next three um, principles are stakeholder orientation, which means that all your stakeholders must benefit. Mm -hmm. um, number The third principle being conscious leadership, because obviously you have to be a conscious leader to care about your stakeholders and to have a, and to have a higher purpose. And the conscious leaders, we create businesses to solve problems as opposed to adhering to a problem that or a, adding a denim to our business. And then the fourth being conscious culture, mm -hmm. where you want to make sure that your employees, your stakeholders all feel invested into your company. Now, looking at this, uh, many people would say this is something that's really great for the developed world like Western Europe, North America, uh, mm -hmm. some places in Asia, a few countries in Latin America. But my thought is, and I think this is something you shared with me, that this really applies to the emerging economies world. Yes. And so how does it really apply to them and how do they feel like that they can be vested and tie into this when they're coming, in a sense, late to the game and they want to be sure they have the resources available to them just like it's happened in the developed world? Well, you know, that's a great question. Uh, one of the ways is that, again, going back to the second principle of stakeholder integration, your stakeholders have to feel invested in your business. And so to your question is, those countries and, and those businesses, they're part of their stakeholders. And so they get to vote with their dollars. They get to vote with their activity and engagement with the actual conscious business. So it is a constant world of engagement, interacting, and making sure that everybody's opinion and everybody's vote is valued. 
Now, looking at that, so you're involving, in other words, the whole planet. Everybody's going to be involved, whether in the what we consider the developed uh, countries, developed world, and then the emerging uh, markets uh, societies, which, you know, there's well over 100, uh, 120, 130 of those. And so, yes. and you look at the African continent, 54 nations, mm -hmm. and I was just, you know, there recently in Tanzania, and you can just feel the energy, you can feel the excitement about people people moving forward, getting education, wanting to contribute, and really leapfrogging ahead as far as the technology is concerned. So how does conscious capitalism incorporate all the technologies at the same time providing opportunities for the humans that are really there to make this work? Well, one of the ways uh, conscious capitalism and great technology is obviously through small businesses being uh, having chapters spread out throughout the world. This is the international movement that was started by Whole Foods owner John Mackey and a gentleman by the name of Michael Strong. And what we focus on is we have 42 chapters worldwide currently. There's chapters in uh, South Africa, there's chapters in Australia, and the way we're able to get other businesses involved is through having local chapters with local businesses that have local connections to the local community. And so everything has a local effort for that particular area. Mm -hmm. So really it goes back to this collaboration but also involving people and that's the stakeholders. So it's the community, yes. it's the people in the businesses, it's the educational institution, it's banking, it's everyone that would be involved as far as trying to move forward but creating new businesses. Looking at the uh, the developing world or the emerging market nations, mm -hmm. how do how do you do you work there with between say an Australia and countries on the African continent, the United States, countries on the African continent, how does all this work so that you have this interplay but at the same time people are respected for who they are and they have equal say in what's going on? That's a great question. Well, one of the ways, obviously, is that, again, um, each chapter is ran by a conscious leader. And what we do is we make sure that we have weekly meetings with our, in our local chapter area. So in each country or each chapter is having local meetings with its community leaders and they're gathering information from the community. The stakeholders are saying what's important to them mm -hmm. uh, with, and make sure that their needs and their, um, their concerns are brought to the table. And from that, then we can now dialogue with the um, president of the Australia chapter, can now dialogue with the president of the chapter in South Africa, and we can look at what, what's similar pains and what, what's working better in South Africa that, that can be implemented in Australia and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So it's sharing across all these different platforms, but at the same time across countries and uh, allowing these conscious leaders then to interact on a, I guess, on a day-to-day -day basis through the internet, et cetera, correct? Absolutely, and, and, what, and what sets the context, again, is those four principles. Mm -hmm. once, you, once you adhere to those four principles, how you adhere to those- will, Enumerate those four right quick. Um, higher purpose being number mm -hmm. one, okay. stakeholder orientation being number two, conscious leadership being number three, and then conscious culture being the fourth principle. Yeah, let's keep embedding those because those are fantastic, and that's really <laughs> great that you bring those out. Conscious capitalism versus the CSR, the corporate social responsibility. What's the difference between those two, and how does one complement the other, or one extends beyond the other? Well, the best way I would say is this. CSR, or corporate social responsibility, is really about companies that have seen, or that's already been created, they hear from the community that there are some issues that their company's not addressing, and they add a addendum to their company, where conscious capitalists are individuals who create their companies to solve a problem. So the company's actually created with the intent to make a difference in the world, as opposed to adding something later on. So what you're doing is you're actually creating a company that has this, course, uh, this conscious uh, capitalism already embedded in it. It's part of the DNA of that particular organization. And so it's already there instead of saying, okay, we need to add this piece. Absolutely. That. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. And we're never driven by, okay, we can't be so conscious because profits are, are dropping. Conscious comes first. Higher purpose comes first. And then people, and if we're creating value, profits, we understand as conscious capitalists that profits will come because of the value that we're offering to the marketplace. Yeah, looking at this uh, conscious capitalism, of course, the environment is of major concern all over the planet because uh, the climate change is, is real and, mm -hmm. and people can feel that on a day-to-day -day basis. So whether people say, hey, it's just a, the, the, the current climate or it's human generated, no matter what it is, it's actually changing. So how do you balance 
balance this where you have social responsibility mm -hmm. and economics <clears throat> and then adding to that, how do you protect the environment? Well, one of the ways is, again, as a conscious capitalist, you have a higher purpose. And your higher purpose is not only to the community, it's, it's to the environment. It's to the planet that we live on. And so a lot of conscious capitalism companies adopt um, environmentally green uh, policies within their company, such as how they go about recycling, uh, reducing on paper and carbon emissions. Uh, myself, for example, I drive a hybrid. You know, and all those things are important because as a conscious capitalist, I see that all of my actions have an effect on the rest of the world, mm -hmm. especially the environment as well. And I want to make sure that if it's going to have an effect, it has a positive effect as opposed to a negative effect. Yeah. And this is the whole thing, too, as far as how you run your business so that actually you're looking at the environment not as something that's added on to it, as we were talking about a little bit earlier. Absolutely. But it's embedded in the DNA as far as the organization itself. Is that Absolutely. correct? Absolutely. And then even within the conscious culture, actually sitting down with our employees and our stakeholders and figuring out how we can actually now become more environmentally conscious and, and actually now live in a more environmentally and make more environmentally sound choices as well. Mm -hmm. So now that feedback, that communication is happening constantly. It's not a once and done. It's a constant involving conversation. Well, we're running out of time, but the whole thing about this conscious business nexus, what is it? How does it operate? And how does that go back and, and actually reinforces what you're doing as far as the conscious capitalism? Well, the Conscious Business Nexus is a conscious business or a directory for conscious businesses to connect worldwide. So if you're looking for a conscious attorney that adheres to your kind of principles, the Conscious Business Nexus is where you'll find them. If you're looking for the conscious uh, architect, anyone that shares your principles and your values, you can be able to connect with them and find them on a Conscious Business Nexus. So it's an online directory so the folks can connect, collaborate, engage, and partner to make the world a better place. We've got two uh, last questions. One is this pain point as far as making profits. They're still businesses. They have to make a profit. They yes. have to return to the stockholders or to the private investors. How do you balance that pain point? Where is it? And how does that go through the Nexus? Well, again, that comes back from clearly understanding what problem your business was created to solve. And if you focus on becoming an expert and truly solving that problem, then that's where the profit comes in it. And your stakeholders will support you. The community will support you because you are actually solving a pain point. Okay, what do you see uh, conscious capitalism in the next 5, 10, 15 years? And we got to be quick. We only have seconds. I see conscious capitalism being the standard, not the exception. That's a fantastic summary. Uh, thank you for being with us. This is Christopher King, co-founder and president of the Conscious Capitalism, D.C. chapter and business director for the Conscious Business Nexus. And thank you for being with us as we're looking at this uh, new way of looking at the world, business, the environment as we create the Emerald Planet. Art, a universal language, an expression of culture, of self, and now, thanks to Empowered Women International, a way for emerging and established immigrant and refugee artists and artisans to find hope to earn a living while enriching the lives of all of us. Empowered Women International, making a better America every day. For more information on Empowered Women International's educational programs, or to make a tax-free donation, contact cfripp at aol.com. tell which kids have trouble with their eyesight. But that's not always the case. Even though one in four children may have a vision problem, eye doctors tell us the symptoms aren't always so obvious. We do know that 80% of all childhood learning is visual. And without good vision, kids can have trouble learning to read. And may fall behind in school. For clues on how to spot the real-life signs of childhood vision problems and what parents can do, visit checkyearly.com.
A public service message from the Vision Council of America and reading is fundamental. We're back to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello, welcome to the Emerald Planet as we're looking around the globe in 144 different nations looking for those thousand best practices, the technology, services and products, and of course the people that are providing the leadership, the intelligence and the innovation as we move through the 21st century. And as we add two billion new people to the planet, how are we going to be able to provide the food, the fuel, the fiber, all of those things that are needed to increase and bring about an increased quality of life? And I have two people that are with us that are going to be talking about these various things. One is going to come in by telephone and the other sitting right beside me. This is Nadine uh, Bailey Joyner, who is the president, personal chef and nutrition maintenance champion. We're going to talk about that long yeah. title there. Uh, and she has what's called Nutrition Synergies, LLC. And also she's the vice president of the Conscious Capitalism of the DC chapter. And then uh, Christopher Bradshaw, who's coming in by telephone, is the founder and executive uh, director of uh, Dreaming Out Loud, Inc. And mm -hmm. uh, Chris, I understand, are you with us on the phone? I'm here. Okay, great. I'll be coming back to you in a minute. Let me kick off with Nadine since she's uh, here with us. Nadine, tell us a little bit about your work, your duties as the founder with this uh, Nutrition uh, Synergies, but also what is a Nutrition Maintenance Champion? I've never heard that uh, title before. Well, wonderful being here. Dr. Sam, I thank you so much for having me on your show. We're glad to have you. Welcome. Nutrition Synergies was a company that was founded out of my personal experience with ill health as it related to food. Once I achieved some level of success in finding ways to revamp recipes and save my own life, people started to ask me, how did you do it? Mm -hmm. So I saw a niche open before me and I wrote a business plan in a way that I could deliver the nuggets of what I had done to, to people at large. So I started to go out into the community and teach people how to reinvent recipes for themselves, to eat more healthful meals in the home, and found myself um, in the underserved population where the, there was a critical need for the information that I was delivering. That's incredible. What a, what a background. And this whole thing about this maintenance champion, this is something you're doing to individuals? Or are you doing this through groups? Or how are you actually sharing this information so that you expand this to as many people as possible? Well, being a fitness or a maintenance champion, a nutrition maintenance champion as you have it, um, it's a boots on the ground effort to actually deliver the services where they're needed. Mm -hmm. So I will meet individuals, I will meet groups, it doesn't matter to me, corporate entities, it doesn't matter. So you could be in communities of faith, churches, civic Anywhere. centers, it doesn't matter. You go out I because go out. this is something you're very passionate about, very you want passionate. to do and make sure that this uh, really happens. Tell us, what is this conscious capitalism and uh, tell us a little bit about that. You're the vice president, so what is it? Conscious Capitalism is an organization that actually deals with businesses that operate consciously in the community. Okay, great. So yes. in other words, they're reaching out and involving uh, everybody within everybody. what's going on, and you're an active member of that. And you were referring to this Christopher King, yes. who is the, uh, the, the founder president, and president founder yes. within the Washington, D.C. Yes. area of this organization. Really good guy. So, Absolutely wonderful. And we're so glad to have him. Uh, Chris, you're on by telephone, I believe. I'm here. Okay, tell us a little bit about your duties on uh, founder, executive director of what's called Dreaming Out Loud. And uh, tell us a little bit about the organization and the origin of the name, actually. Yeah, so Dreaming Out Loud is a nonprofit social enterprise here in Washington, D.C. Uh, our mission is to build an equitable food system, economic opportunity for all, and more resilient communities. And we've just seen the food system as a way for building opportunity in community. And the origin of the name is uh, something that <clears throat> emerged about six or seven years ago. Um, you know, my partner at the time, uh, we had the vision to start a nonprofit and uh, combine it with the, you know, the aspects of music, film, and other, you know, popular, you know, elements of shaping popular culture to really move 
uh, sustainability and inspiration through communities. And one night we were sitting around playing a uh, a name uh, game, trying to come up with a name for what this entity would be called. And uh, we had all these different words and different verbs that started before uh, the, the last two words out loud. And we had, you know, running out loud and all these other <laughs> iterations. Um, but we went through iteration after iteration. And then <clears throat> he went to go get a drink of water and walked out of the kitchen and said, I got it. It should be dreaming out loud. And that's, that was that's kind of incredible. the origin. Now, uh, looking at this uh, photograph, this is uh, the handsome you, since you're not here in the studio with us. <laughs> and it looks like you're in a very large uh, hot house and all kinds of greenery in the background. What is this? Is this some of the food that you're actually uh, generating? Tell us a little bit about the environment that we see here. Yeah, so you're likely looking at a picture of me in a, in a greenhouse. Um, you know, we are, as a social enterprise, uh, a farm, a farmer's market, and a food hub. So that means that we are vertically integrated in the food system. We do a lot. We grow food. We work with other farmers to distribute food. And we also uh, run a network of farmers markets where we convene farmers and other vendors uh, to you know, have an economic opportunity for people in communities and, a, and an access point for folks in communities to, to purchase healthy, affordable local produce. Uh, Chris, looking at this whole notion of food desert is something that you hear all the time and my impression, since I'm very aware of the food, farmers markets that are going on in Washington, D.C., it's now hitting either towards 30 or over 30 now, and uh, many other cities the same way. So is, are you, through this whole effort of Dreaming Out Loud, is actually to address this as far as the of food deserts and making sure that people, regardless of socioeconomic backgrounds, have actually access to fresh fruits and uh, vegetables. Absolutely, we're working very hard to act to uh, you know solve the problem of food deserts. And in order to do that, you have to address the confluence of circumstances. It's just not an access problem. It's a uh, it's an economic problem in terms of folks having the ability uh, to obtain the employment to purchase healthy food, but also to have the opportunity within the food system to generate their own employment or uh, to even have the skills necessary to grow food within communities that which, which can help to alleviate some of the circumstances that we see and the resulting negative health impacts. Yeah, uh, no play on words, but this really is the, uh, the new green economy and new green jobs, correct? That's true. That's very true. And uh, I think it's very important, you know, for organizations like Dreaming Out Loud to be able to pass along the skills and grow them within communities. Otherwise, what we're going to see is low-income communities, communities of color, still having the skills gaps and the resource gaps that will perpetuate the gaps that we see in other, uh, uh, you know, eras or, or, or transformations of the economy. When we move from you know, an industrial base to a more tech-based economy because of those skills gaps and the resource gaps. People of color were often left out of the, you know, wealth creation <clears throat> that resulted from those changes in the economy. Um, as we move to having to produce more food, uh, having to solve these challenges in the food system, the same thing is going to happen if we aren't addressing who has access to resources and skills to take advantage of the opportunities. All right, well, we're going to go back to this uh, photograph. This is uh, dealing with Nadine as far as her nutrition uh, synergies. What is the mm -hmm. uh, environmental, environmental sustainability, the mission and plan that you have, which really uh, dovetails with what Chris was just talking about? And let's bring up this photograph here because we can see all this fresh fruits and uh, vegetables that Nadine uh, has. There we go. Absolutely. Well, the sustainability um, efforts for Nutrition Synergies initially started with us being conscious of eco-friendly packaging and things of that nature, utilizing the entire product not to waste anything and, and uh, those type of measures. Then we kind of wanted to take it a bit further and understand that the sustainability of the environment as a whole starts in communities. And we wanted to teach local communities how to have a better relationship with fresh, whole, clean foods give them the basic food education that they need to 
um, bring those foods into the home and process them and create simple meals and hopefully bring more food to the table. Bringing more food to the table, of course, keeps families out of um, fast food type establishments where they're utilizing all of the echo unfriendly type packaging, styrofoam and plastic bags and things of that nature. So if we one by one can just exponentially reach out to urban families, have them create uh, simple, clean, whole food meals in the home, it takes the strain off of the environment in that aspect. And then taking it even further to look at how food affects folks in their chemistry and their biology. I believe that there are so many issues in children in urban communities behind the fact that they're not eating fresh, whole, clean foods. I think there are a lot of behavioral issues that stem from um, over-processed foods and things of that nature, and then they act out into the community and it creates other issues, crime, and just this yeah. unrest. If you look at uh, psychologists, uh, psychiatrists, uh, counselors, they're yes. saying over a third of all the problems of children, particularly in inner city schools, but all schools, yes. it's uh, basically uh, food allergies. Absolutely. And uh, being allergic to the food they're actually eating. Uh, looking at this, uh, buying food from uh, local community, local farmers, how do you do that? We have to be very quick because I have one more question for Chris. Well, well, buying food from local farmers is actually a very good effort, and it's, it's not as hard as it used to be due to the fact that there's so much local produce available now due to the urban farming uh, efforts that are happening in the community. Nutrition Synergies um, has a commitment to purchase locally because we believe that when you purchase locally, you keep the farmers growing, and then we keep the fresh foods flowing into the families. That's fantastic. Let yes. me, uh, Chris, uh, echo what we just heard, and we got to be quick. Uh, okay. about the importance of uh, growing locally and providing uh, local foods to local people. you got about 15 seconds. 15 seconds. There's yep, three gotta quick, be quick points. <clears throat> it is cutting the food miles, uh, which is very important because it reduces the amount that our food travels, so we lose, use less fossil fuels. Uh, nutrient density is retained when we grow more food locally. And finally, when we localize the food economy, that means more dollars are circulating. And thank you very community. much as we create the Emerald Planet. Listen to smoke before you give it a try. Only you. Don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Fire. Cause there's nothing very funny about Rick Dot Money. Nothing very nice. A homeless mind. So if a gorgeous force is what you desire, don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Only you can prevent wildfires. Fire. Why don't you just wash your car at home? When I wash my car, everything runs down the street and down into the storm drains. With all the chemicals and the soaps and waxes, the last thing I want to do is poison my own drinking water. At least here, it's all contained and recycled on site. That's why I also take my car in for oil changes instead of doing it myself. I might take a chance on spilling stuff. You know what the best part is? What? More time to kick back and watch the game. How far would you go? to protect the planet. I want you to build an ark. Here we go! Okay, that's good. Oh, okay. Ow! Oh, oh, oh. Maybe there's another way. People! The flood is imminent! Is it too much to ask for a little precipitation? Go to fightglobalwarming.com to find out what you and your community can do to reduce global warming pollution. Somewhere around the world, there are men and women of the armed forces risking their lives, helping rebuild communities after natural disasters, collecting toys for needy children, tutoring kids in school. These are your sons and daughters who work to keep us safe, secure, and free. Dedicated men and women who put their country first. to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. 
Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you from Washington, D.C. on a week-to-week -week basis as we're looking around the globe for those leaders that are making a true difference as far as a, a planet that's going to 9 billion people and how we're going to be able to take care of them, not only as far as the food, the fuel, the fiber, but also the housing and the other basic infrastructure of education, health care, all these many needs. And at the same time, to make sure that they actually have an increased quality of life and not just exist. And I have someone sitting right beside me who's very much involved in all this. This is Nancy Guzman. She's an attorney and she's the principal and real estate attorney for what's called Brick House Title LLC. Mm -hmm. And Nancy, welcome to the Emerald Planet TV. Thank you. And we have your uh, logo here. Tell us a little bit about what is Brick House Title LLC? Brickhouse Title LLC is a full service settlement company. We handle both residential and commercial real estate transactions. We specialize in dealing with the um, emotionally and technically challenging transactions. So on one side, I work with real estate investors, trying to help them keep their transactions legal and ethical. On the other side, I deal with consumers. Um, so that might be a first time home buyer. It might be a homeowner in distress. Um, or it might just be that somebody's trying to buy or sell a house and there are legal issues that um, interfere and we have to resolve those legal issues. Now looking at this, I know there are many title companies, they've been around for <laughs> dozens, yep. you know, a, a century or more. What makes a Brick House LLC different than other title companies? Um, well, for one thing, we're a Maryland Benefit LLC. What makes a company a benefit corporation or a benefit LLC is that as part of our charter, um, we have a mission to give back to the community. So what we do at Brickhouse Title is that we, um, I give a number of pro bono hours to distressed homeowners and first time home buyers, trying to assist them in um, getting what they need to get in order to move on with their lives. Um, I also, um, we also, um, <laughs> We, we also contribute a portion of our proceeds to um, housing-oriented nonprofit organizations. Now looking at that, I know that this is something that uh, you're really passionate about because there's an organization you're part of that we're going to mention in uh, a few minutes. But this whole thing about uh, giving all this time to people, these uh, we can say at-risk people mm -hmm. or special needs uh, people as far as their housing is concerned and all that, why would you be committed to doing that? Because this is really a special mission that you have is quite unique. Well, because I see that there's this gap out there. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of title companies that are just focused on getting the transactions through. They're focused on the paper. And we're a very paper-oriented um, industry. And a lot of the title companies, they're just basically focused on the paper and they're not paying attention to the actual people mm -hmm. who are involved. And I'm always focusing on those people. I'm trying to get them what it is they need out of the transaction. Now, looking at this uh, slide here, this is something that you're actually holding seminars and helping people, advising, giving them advice, mm -hmm. which really goes beyond the bounds as far as what a normal title company would mm -hmm. be doing anyway. So what kinds of things are they learning in this kind of group setting that's really important to them and helps them to move forward as far as solidifying their life, but also as it relates to their housing and giving them stability so they can move forward for the future in a more positive and proactive manner? Well, I'll start with the real estate investors. Um, a lot of investors go to programs, seminars, webinars, et cetera, where they're learning how to invest in real estate. What they're not learning is how to keep the transaction fair and equitable, how to make sure that they're not crossing any ethical or moral boundaries. Okay? Um, as far as the home buyers are concerned, um, I'm trying to teach them how to properly buy a house, how to educate themselves before they actually go out and look for a house. Um, and the home sellers, the distressed homeowners, I'll sit down with them and I'll lay out all their possible options as to how they might deal with whatever their distress situation is 
and help them figure out which is the best course for them. Now this sounds like this is a lot of time involved. It's something that's not a fee based as far as you know actually doing this work, working this hands on or, or taking them hand and leading them mm -hmm. through this whole process. So how much time does it take and do you and your staff give to these people that have these issues that you're trying to help solve so that they actually can move forward with the transaction? I would say that I probably give about 10 hours a week on average. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's a little bit more, sometimes it's a little bit less, but on average I would say it's about 10 hours a week. Mm -hmm. Now looking at that, would this be uh, 10 hours across everyone within your organization or just you or it's mostly how does that me. happen? <laughs> it's mostly me handling it. I have my staff handling the paperwork end of it. Right. Um, so that frees me up to actually give the, the legal counsel that the clients are looking for. Now this is something you, you've mentioned actually from the very uh, introduction is that you want to make sure that things are legal and equitable and, mm -hmm. and that people are actually treated in a very ethical manner. So when you're just looking at the industry itself, there's been many changes yes. you know, since the, the big bust as far as the uh, real estate uh, industry uh, some years ago mm -hmm. now. So what what change for the better that really gives this impetus to make sure that we're really meeting the needs of these people? Or is it still you have to drag the industry uh, through all of this and for them to reach out to the people that really need the help and the services? Well, to some extent, the government is dragging them through it. Okay, So there's been a number of changes to both federal and state laws that are attempting to make the transaction more transparent and to protect the consumers. Mm -hmm. um, there is a push for um, education to the consumer about the transaction, but unfortunately that education isn't really going far enough yet. So looking at this, what do you think needs to be done as far as this balance between the government, uh, the private enterprise, and local governments on, on the other hand of that, and the citizen? How do, you, how do you balance all of this out so that everybody feels like that they're you know, they're being treated equally in this whole process, and at the same time, it's fair for all. So the, the businesses can make money, the government, you know, has its taxes it can mm -hmm. collect, but people get to stay in their home or get into a home. Um, that's a really difficult question. Um, and the reason is because the biggest player in this is the banking industry, the mortgage industry. And they're always going to be dragged, kicking and screaming into paying attention to the consumer. But if we can grow this conscious capitalism movement, um, I think that, as King has said previously, um, we, would have, we would not be the exception anymore. We would be the rule. And we're going to drag the banking industry with us into this conscious capitalism environment. Now, uh, we're talking about uh, Christopher King, I believe, yes. who actually is the founder and, and uh, helped start this uh, uh, conscious capitalism in Washington, D.C., and uh, doing a very good job with that. Well, how does this conscious capitalism work? What is it, and how does that impact your business, but also the relationships that you establish with your clients and the governments, everybody that you're dealing with? So my personal definition of conscious capitalism is I treat my employees and my customers and my clients the way I would want to be treated. And that's really that simple. I remember simple. there's something uh, about all that, treat others as uh, we want to be treated ourselves, correct? Exactly, exactly. And I didn't even know that I was a conscious capitalist until Christopher King came along and told me I was a conscious capitalism capitalist. I'd never even heard of the movement. Um, my father was the CEO of a chain of retail stores and a wholesale operation. And he always treated his employees and his customers the way he would like to be treated. Mm -hmm. And so this is how I learned how to run a business. And So um, this is really part of your personal DNA and this is something that come yeah. down through your family to that. Mm -hmm. Is this something as far as this uh, conscious capitalism, you think this is something that actually can be studied and, and trained or is something that people need to be born with or how, how do you balance that or how do you see this evolving in society? My personal opinion is that this is how businesses used to operate. And we've come into a, an era where instead of operating in a manner where we are focused on our customers and our clients, business has gotten away from that. And business has gotten more into how do I make more money? 
And I think it's not very difficult to see the pendulum swinging back. So you feel like that the, the balance is going back to where we really need to treat the customer, the client, in a very fair manner and, and at the same time look at how do we balance what's going on within the organization so it makes a profit at the same time. Absolutely. I think the consumer is going to actually be the ones to drive it. I look at the companies out there that are conscious capitalist companies and that's where the consumers are going to shop because that's where they're being treated better. Mm -hmm. Now looking at that, uh, so really what you're saying is, is that if, you're, if you buy into this conscious capitalism concept, the philosophy of that is actually the, the client is then going to be following that because they feel like that they're going to get a better treatment, but at mm -hmm. the same time, possibly a better business deal than if they were dealing with someone that's just in it for the profit. Is exactly. that what you're saying? Yep. Now, looking at uh, your dad and his background, how, what do you think he brought home and that you were able to absorb besides the fact of, you know, just treat people as you want to be treated? What else did you feel like that you've gained that helped you run your own business? Um, a business acumen. Mm -hmm. um, I understand, again, how to treat my employees, um, how to budget my company, um, how to make sure that I'm not overspending in certain areas so that I do have reserves for other things. And um, you know, from, from the time I was young, I was working in the business. Um, we were always recruited to go in and do stuff. I was running a cash register at the age of nine. Oh, well, that's incredible, um, a lot of background. So we were always, we were always part of the business. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, looking at this, and I'm going to end with this uh, particular slide right here as far as, what do you see for the future growth and development as far as your uh, brick house title LLC? Well, right now, I'm really young. I've only been in business for three years. Um, so I'm really in a growing stage, but I don't want to grow too big. I always want to make sure that I'm maintaining um, sight of my goals mm -hmm. and that I don't get so big that I lose control over the process. And that's really where I'm headed. Fantastic. Last question. What, what are the intangibles that you get in out of having your own business, but also in, invoking this conscious capitalism model? We got to be quick. Okay. Um, the intangibles is that it's the most rewarding thing in the world to help somebody accomplish their goals and to have somebody at the end of the day with tears in their eyes giving me a hug and thanking me because I found a solution to their That's problem. That's absolutely fantastic. What a great summary for that. This is Nancy uh, Guzman. She's an attorney, uh, principal, and also an attorney in real estate with the Brick House uh, Title LLC. Also an active member of what's called Conscious uh, Capitalism, of the DC chapter. And thank you for being with us as we look around the globe as we create the Emerald Planet. Saving for retirement might be easy for some folk, but for others, it might take a little more work. And for those who haven't started, there are still things you can do to catch up. Oh, that is good news. Like getting out from underneath past debt. And don't get wrapped up with high interest credit cards. Let's get you some eyes. Be diversified with your investments. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Your financial goals are not out of reach. The choice is clear. For a happy ending, choose to save. Everyone with alcohol and drug addiction is in the same boat. With treatment, you can find solid ground. For drug and alcohol information and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Dude, are you sure you want this tattoo? Because, just do it! Some mistakes in life are permanent. Like hearing loss. To learn how to protect your hearing, visit ASHA.org. You've probably heard about heart disease, but did you know that it's the number one killer of women nationwide? Heart disease claims more lives each year than breast cancer, lung cancer, or strokes combined. But there are steps you can take to protect yourself against it. 
For more information on how you can prevent heart disease, contact your local American Heart Association or visit their website at www.americanheart.org. We're back to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet and Emerald Planet TV as we come to you from uh, looking at 144 nations, looking for those thousand best practices, the technology, services, and products that are needed as we move through the 21st century. And as we go to a planet of 9 billion people by 2050 is being projected and maybe 12 to 13 billion by the end of the century, how are we going to be able to provide everything that they need? And we have uh, two gentlemen that are joining us. One's coming in by telephone, the other sitting right here in the studio with me. Uh, this is uh, Christopher King. And he's with what's called cap Conscious Capitalism mm -hmm. and then also the uh, Conscious Business Nexus. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And then coming in by telephone is uh, Rich Rudy, who is the founder of what's called Manor Ventures, LLC. Uh, Rich, are you with us? Hey, yes, I am. Very pleased to be here. Thank uh, you. We're glad to have you with us. Tell us a little bit about your organization, the uh, Manor Ventures, LLC. Well, for about 30 years, I've, I've been involved in the real estate business. I've had a passion uh, for real estate probably ever since I was in high school. And um, out of college, I went to work for a home building company, large company, and uh, eventually went to a smaller company that we ended up building about 2,500 houses in the um, Baltimore, Washington uh, metro area. Um, at the same time, I, I became licensed as a real estate broker that dated back until the, the mid-80s. So I, I do a whole series of real estate-related activities. In recent years, uh, you, know, the, you know, the real estate business has changed a little bit in terms of builders building and acquisition development for smaller companies, and it's become a little bit more difficult, plus the marketplace that we've experienced in recent years. Uh, so I developed this uh, company, Manor Ventures, uh, with the, the social mission that I would be able to do what I have a passion to do to build and develop and redevelop. A lot of what we're doing now is not just building new, but uh, building or taking existing properties that are in disrepair um, and, uh, and bringing them to life. Uh, the, the, the twist is that uh, based upon past experiences with people that I know, uh, I've decided to use to have a social mission in that I would use a, la a labor force, a challenged labor force, uh, much of which uh, to date has been in, from drug and alcohol addicted individuals who are, are you know, trying to get back into society. You have uh, many organizations that are doing drug testing and the whole thing is is keep people like that out of being <laughs> part of the business and what you're doing is you're actively going out and recruiting people with these kinds of challenged uh, backgrounds. And so you're really uh, inspired to create this Manor Ventures. How would you define inspiration as far as the work that you're doing? And why are you reaching down into bringing people that would be at-risk communities, at-risk individuals, and bringing them to the fore as far as the labor pool? Well, uh, and you know, it, when I hit my stride in business, uh, you know, I, it, it became obvious to me that I, you know, I had a desire to give back. And um, a few years ago, I read a book called Halftime. It was written by a gentleman who experienced a lot of success in business and suggested that, you know, the second half of your life uh, can be a catalyst, uh, you know, to invoke purpose and impact and growth and, and assistance, uh, you know, to others. So, um, you know, my recent experiences uh, with the AA community and get coming to a greater understanding uh, of, of how that organization works, um, I became very comfortable uh, with the, the fact that these are talented individuals mm -hmm. 
who had a very rough patch in life, they've reached out to an organization that's designed to, um, you know, to straighten them, put them back on the right path, and that uh, that that I could utilize that labor and be their inspiration in some, some respect and, and assist them in, in getting back on their feet. That's absolutely fantastic. And sitting right beside me, as I introduced earlier, is Christopher King. He goes by King, and uh, he also brought the conscious capitalism to uh, the D.C. Uh, metropolitan region. How does uh, a, a company like uh, Manor Ventures fit into this conscious capitalism? Explain a little bit about that, and then how is this just another example of the type of people that you're attracting into the organization? Well, you know, Manor Ventures fits in the conscious capitalism model because of the fact that the founder has a higher purpose. He sees a problem in the community, and he says, I can create a company around that, but not only can I solve the problem of dilapidated and blighted homes in Baltimore City, but I also can take a underused labor force and teach them education, empower them so they can come back, and now I'm creating jobs as well. So you know, Rich has done a great job with Manor Ventures, and that's why he's a conscious capitalist. Mm -hmm. And looking at uh, conscious capitalism, just explain briefly what that means, and why is this whole thing, as far as this uh, Manor Ventures, uh, really fit very snugly into your vision of what conscious capitalism is all about? Yes, again, conscious capitalism is an international movement that was created by Whole Foods owner John Mackey, the gentleman by the name of Michael Strong, and it's based upon four core operating principles. Uh, number one is that you have to have a higher purpose, which Man Adventure does. You have to make sure your stakeholders all benefit, stakeholder orientation, which he's making sure the community, he's creating jobs, it fits in that model. Number three is being a conscious leader. As you heard his story, he's a conscious leader for him to develop concepts like that for Man Adventures as a, as a way of solving a problem. And then number four, creating conscious culture. And that's really what we all do within conscious companies. It's that all the members of conscious capitalism, we believe in having a culture that's inviting, that's inspiring, and more importantly, love is a concept theme that gets reverberated throughout the entire organization. Looking at uh, Baltimore, I just drove through there last week, actually twice, and uh, you could say Baltimore in some ways a very beautiful, uh, lovely uh, old industrial city. Uh, definitely uh, some challenges in uh, different areas. So looking at Manor Ventures and how do you see that fitting long term into uh, within the state of Maryland of uh, rebuilding Baltimore to something that's actually going to transform itself into something that's going beyond what it has been and maybe even grander than, and uh, in a sense more glorious than what it was in the past. Well, you know, Baltimore City is is a city of neighborhoods. It always has been w wonderful neighborhoods, and uh, you know, there's a need for this type of thing everywhere. But in, in a metropolitan area, just by nature, there's always a greater uh, need. And um, you know, uh, there, there's there are just huge benefits, all kinds of uh, socioeconomic ben benefits. Uh, to uh, real estate development, residential development. In my, in my case, that's where where I where I focus. Where jobs are created, um, job training uh, occurs. Um, we're talking about uh, the American dream. The home ownership is fulfilling the American dream. Middle class or or lower middle class families, much of their their personal wealth comes from ownership in real estate. You have to live somewhere, and uh, why not? own a property and then all you have all of the intangible uh, you know benefits that come along with home ownership um, civic uh, neighborhoods um, uh, people generally are just happier uh, uh, satisfaction all of that just sort of those intangible things and there's a, there's a very great need probably in most metropolitan areas but obviously in in the city of Baltimore, the city of Baltimore has a program called Vacants to Value. They have a li actually have a list of properties that are just non-performing. They're just sitting there, boarded up, and every one of those properties represents an opportunity. And um, there's really a great need in the city. I tell you, that's uh, very exciting, Rich, and what you're doing and how you're reaching into the communities. And like I said, I drove through there twice just last week, and so I can see some of those areas where you actually see the transformation uh, beginning to happen. But you could have chosen uh, some smaller towns, some other cities uh, within the, the state of Maryland or within the region. 
why Baltimore specifically and when you could have had, say, a national model program and something where you had a fewer number of homes that needed to be uh, renovated or revamped and uh, maybe a little less challenging, uh, easier to manage, but yet you actually took the largest city in the whole state. So why Baltimore? That, that's a huge challenge that you took on. Well, once again, because it's the area of, of, uh, of greatest need. Uh, um, the, uh, a lot of the redevelopment that has occurred in Baltimore City has occurred around the Inner Harbor area. And uh, what, what has happened is that uh, the, these, were, these were areas that were probably underperforming somewhat, but they, they really went through a transformation, and in some respects a transformation to bring a different, um, maybe a more affluent or higher income type owner into the area where our, our thought process is that uh, we can do redevelopment in areas, and it's widespread in the city opportunities. And the, the, the person that's going to occupy the, the home that's underperforming boarded up is the person that lives right around the corner and is renting. Um, so, you know, once again, there, there's just tremendous opportunity, and, and, and that will be the goal to, to, you know, there are people living currently in the city um, and, you know, to introduce them to home ownership and all the benefits of, uh, you know, of home ownership. That's, that's, a, that's a fantastic answer. King, looking at this as far as, and we're running out, absolutely out of time, but looking at what Rich is doing, how do you see conscious capitalism as an organization being able to help someone like him so that you're bringing more resources, more people, more thoughts, ideas, energy to help someone like Rich, who's obviously very dedicated to the community and wants to do good? Well, one of the ways... Got about uh, 30 to 40 seconds to do all that. Okay, short answer is that, again, Conscious Capitalism was created by Whole Foods owner John Mackey. Now, as we talk about community redevelopment in Baltimore, we buy those properties, we renovate them, we partner with organizations like Whole Foods, bring supermarkets, and collectively we can all collaborate to do greater than we could do on our own. Yeah. So again, it's the collective that's uh, working on this. Rich, we've got about uh, 20 seconds left. Where do you see for your organization next 5, 10, or 15 years? Well, uh, right now this organization is, uh, I've I've uh, built it uh, just over the last uh, six months. R right now we're doing small projects and, and there are really great needs. So my, my vision in the near term in the next year, two years, would be that we could, we could develop programs and do it in, in larger numbers. And then, and then I, I think uh, a program like what we're thinking of can be plugged in in other markets around the United States. That's fantastic national model program. Thank you for uh, being with us on the Emerald Planet uh, TV, talking about uh, Manor Ventures, conscious capitalism, as we look around the globe to create the Emerald Planet. King, thank you for being with us. Very nice job, and you have.